You are listening to the Mindset Forge podcast, where athletes and performing artists discuss their biggest moments and mindset shifts that made them so successful. High-level athletes and performing artists understand how to show up for the big moments, how to be present and on point when everything counts. That's what I want to find out about, and that's what I want to help understand so that we can take some of those amazing nuggets and implement them in our own lives. I'm your host, Barton Bryan, and I'm an athlete. I'm a fitness coach. I'm a former actor and singer, and I love helping people discover their fullest potential. In this interview, I speak with Brittany Conagati. She's a Broadway dancer, choreographer, and so much more. She has such a great mindset around performance, discipline, the hard work it takes, and never taking for granted that she made it to Broadway. As so many professional actors, singers, and dancers learned at the pandemic, it can all be taken away. Broadway hasn't even been happening for the last year and a half. It is just about to come back. But she was also a subbing professional soccer player, which really informs the way she understands her body, sport, and performance, and how they're so much alike, and how she needs to be at her absolute best physically when she shows up on stage to perform. One specific takeaway that you're going to get is how she auditions how she prepares and how she walks in there knowing that no matter what happens, even if she doesn't get the role, she has done her best and that's all that matters. So without further ado, Brittany Conagati. Really great to have you on, Brittany. Thank how you. How are you feeling today? I'm so excited. So excited to be on Yeah, here. thank you for doing this. Yeah, this is awesome. So as a performing artist, one of the things that I really want to go into with you is first and foremost, as a dancer, you are an athlete of athletes. And so I want to start with some questions about you as an athlete growing up, kind of what your background is, even before dance. Great. So go ahead. So I started super young in dancing school. I would say around the age of two and a half, I was able to do it at the studio, my local studio. My mom put me in. I absolutely loved it. And I sort of did it as a hobby up until about seventh grade. That's where it became super imperative on whether or not there's a performing arts school in Manhattan called LaGuardia which a lot of the dance teachers that have trained me were saying that I was eligible for and I really should audition for. But I was very nervous to travel into Manhattan at the age of 13 for high school. So it was one of those decisions of like, let me just audition and see what happens. And so I ended up getting into the school. There was 90 of us accepted out of all of the five boroughs in New York City, which is a huge accomplishment in itself. And that is where I sort of took my training. And rather than just go straight through with dance. By my senior year, we took an elective in musical theater and I fell in love with performing musical theater. I've seen countless Broadway shows from the age of like four and up. And I always was drawn to watching it, being a part of it, being in the theater, being an audience member. And I always would love to want to do it, but I was very shy and very nervous to sing, especially sing. (laughs) And other than dance, dance was sort of a form of communication that came much more natural to me than having to sing and dance. So before I took dance seriously, I was actually really into soccer. I was on three teams growing up. I was on my recreational team for my school. Then I was on a travel team. And then I ended up playing for the women's team of New York State at the age of 12, which is pretty unheard of. (laughs) A friend and I were asked to be a part of the team and we From there, I got to travel to Canada and Florida and Virginia playing with women in their 20s, which was a semi-professional team. So technically, I guess you can say I was a semi-professional soccer player at the age of 12 and 13. So I started understanding what training was at a very young age because you were doing two practices a day. If I was on three teams, I would have three practices or four practices throughout the week. So I was constantly either in a dance class or running on the soccer field. Besides all of like the extracurricular school things you do, like being on a cheerleading team and all, you know what I mean? Like all those other things. So I sort of have had this discipline instilled in me from a very young age. So I think that also has helped me propel into now being on Broadway and seeing that discipline, whether or not you're in sports or you're in theater or you're in dance or you're in any other professional aspect that you need to have this discipline that comes along with it. So that has sort of been, I think, one of the things that has helped me reach the goal that I've set for myself. So, yeah. Do you remember, I mean, obviously that time when you, you had to make a choice going to LaGuardia. It was knowing you were going to have to step away from. So hard. I could imagine. I didn't actually think. Because you were at such a high level. And I didn't think that they would really make me choose. They say it when you're like doing the orientation and you get into the, the high school. 
And they were like, just so you know, the only sport you're allowed to do is swimming because you're constantly in high school, you're dancing. I was dancing three hours a day, every day, Monday through Friday, plus with my local studio and different conventions and taking classes in the city at Broadway Dance Center and Steps on Broadway. So you are using, I know why they now say it as an adult, but as a 13 year old, I'm like, are you kidding? I can't leave soccer. Like I've been doing this for just as long as I've been doing dance. And it wasn't until really my big part of your identity at that time. And until my senior year, I wanted to be a professional soccer player. Like that was truly my goal. I wanted to be on the Olympic women's soccer team and I was going to do it in some parallel universe. So crazy, right? You you know, you could have been in in Tokyo playing soccer. I know. I know. (laughs) So of course I still follow the sport and I absolutely love the sport, but soccer also wears on your body. And it became, which is weird at the age of 13 that I'm thinking that is my body being a soccer player. Maybe you can go to your 30s. Some go into their 40s if you like really take care of yourself. But then it starts to wear down and Mm. injuries happen and all that comes with being a professional athlete in that respect. And then with dance and theater, it's sort of I seem to see more of a longevity with the career and just a love for being able to bring pleasure to other people that come to the theater to escape their sort of crappy day or reality and enter our world of like, now we're in this show. And now you were going to fully submerge you into whatever show we're doing for today. And you're going to forget everything that are outside of the theater doors and just come in here and experience this whole new thing. And I got part of that with soccer. And I truly still like part of me always just wants to go play. Like I still will go to the field and like kick some balls around my husband and I'll still you know, watch games with him all the time. Like we absolutely love the sport still, but it is. And it taught me a lot about being a team player and creating the discipline of like how to eat healthier, how to exercise for what you need your body to do for you. And it allowed me with within dance, excuse me, to now use those tools that I learned at such a young age to keep the longevity of my career, hopefully for, you know, a few more years. (laughs) <laughs> well, and we'll talk about this more later, but I mean, as a dancer, you now are also a choreographer. You're a, you've been a dance captain, right. you're teaching dance and you have your own website and there's mm-hmm. a lot that you can do with that. Absolutely. And that, it's, uh, it's not as extensive, allow you to have right, more and more in, longevity in the soccer field, which is sad, but yeah. I mean, sometimes you just have to be realistic with what you think your life is going to look like or be. And I mean, honestly, when I chose not to go to, I was already being scouted for college for soccer. Like it was like a, a very big transition from being a soccer player to now <laughs> going and doing theater. And I theater I did as like a fun community thing with my friends because they all did theater growing up, but it was never something that was mm-hmm. in my wheelhouse from a very, very young age. Like I feel like majority of Broadway performers have. Like a lot of them have started from such a young age like I did with soccer and dance and have done theater all throughout their life. I didn't truly, I sort of fell into it by mistake when I went to an audition and ended up booking the show. And then I truly just loved every part of it. But my first job out of, it was in high school. I auditioned for high school musical at Paper Mill Playhouse and knew nothing really of the theater, knew nothing of the industry, just saw an audition notice. And it was like meeting like jazz hip hop dancers for high school musical for this on stage production. And I was like, I could do that. Like I tumble. I can do jazz. I could do hip hop. I could do any form of dance. So this will be fun. So let me just go. They needed, they wanted the high school age. So I went in, did the audition. There was thousands of people somehow kept getting called back. I knew one song from our group voice class in high school from the elective that we took. And it was all that jazz, which is so not appropriate for high school musical at all. So (laughs) when I went in and they were like, what will you be singing for us today? I was like, I only know and have sheet music for one song and it's all that jazz from Chicago. And they, the faces behind the table were like, Oh, okay. Mm. You look very young to be singing this, but let's give it a shot. And so then I sang that song. I actually think they made me sing happy birthday after it. And they're like, do you have anything else? I was like, no, I, this is literally the only piece of sheet music I own. So I have nothing else, but I could sing a song that that might be on the radio or something that that is like common for everyone. And they're like, how about happy birthday? which is a deceivingly very difficult song because it jumps an octave in the middle of the song, which me having zero singing training and zero knowledge of music didn't know that. So I was like, yeah, I can sing happy birthday. Like, where do we want to start? And the guy like plunks the note on the co- the computer on the piano. And I was like, great. And as we're singing then halfway through, I was like, oh, I was like, this is really high. And they were like, okay. 
So I ended up booking that show. I found out in my forensics class in high school and I saw my agent. Oh no, I didn't have an agent. Time. I saw the casting director calling me and I looked at my teacher and I was like, I think I have to take this. Like, can I step out of class? And she was like, yeah, sure. I stepped out and I, they literally were like, so we would love for you to be a part of the company of High School Musical at Paper Mill Playhouse. Rehearsals start on this date. Performances start here. We close on this date. And I just responded with, awesome. What do I do about school? And they were dumbfounded. They were like, what do you mean school? I was like, oh, I'm in high school. And they were so blindsided by the fact that I was in high school. They're like, we didn't know that. Like, we would have probably not considered you had we known you'd been in high school. I was like, oh, that's okay. Like, I I go to performing arts school. I'm sure I can make this work. Like, this is what we're here for. I'm training for. I've been here for four years. Like, I'm sure it's not a problem. Meanwhile, you are not supposed to be working when you go to LaGuardia. It is truly a high school where you're training to then become a professional. They train you for that. So I had Mm -hmm. to present the idea to the head of the dance department at LaGuardia. And luckily, she was an incredible lady. Her name is Michelle Mathesius. I owe a lot to her for the amount of times that she would sneak me out of high school to go to auditions. Because truly, I think without her allowing me to do that, I don't know if I'd be really where I am at this point in my career. Mm -hmm. So she allowed me to use the dance credits that I would have gotten during school and applied those to me now doing this professional show. So I was going to like my first and second period academic classes. And then running to rehearsal downtown and then coming back to school during my lunch hour to go and do whatever tests or things I had to make up. And I would go back to rehearsal to finish out the day and I'd go back to high school to do whatever I had to do after school. So I was a yo-yo between LaGuardia on 65th Street and the rehearsal studio, which was downtown (laughs) in the city. So the cab bill for my poor dad was very expensive. I will say that. (laughs) Bless your dad. Exactly. <laughs> Talk, I mean, you, it sounds like the audition, actually, you didn't have a lot of expectations. You were walking oh, in the first time auditioning. Oh, I had zero audition. expectations because I had no right. idea even Which what happened at these auditions. Beautiful. Perfect. Right? right, right. Honestly, going yeah, in completely like, oh, is always to me a better option than going in as if you know everything. I always go in as if I know nothing. So going into that audition, I actually knew nothing. And it was one of those where I just went on the whim, learned the combo, thought it was really fun. Dennis Jones is the choreographer and it was super athletic and very much in my wheelhouse. Like it felt like I belonged in that show. I ended up being a cheerleader, which I've been a cheerleader or I was a cheerleader majority of my childhood as well. I was on like a travel cheerleading team when I was younger and then did it for my grammar school and intermediate school. So it's like I've sort of was it felt right. And then I was the girl in rehearsal who sat and when like music rehearsal would start, they would say, "Okay." Now, like this note, we're going to hold it for this amount of counts or this note means this. Or so I literally was writing with pencil in all of the the music, the sheet music of like what each thing meant. It was like legato, slow down or whatever the, the thing was so that I could literally right, go too. back or I'd look at the girl next to me. I'm like, what are, what are they meaning? And she's like, oh, you have no idea yeah. what's going on. I was like, not a clue, not a clue. And then when we had to do dance and singing together, they're like, Brittany, you have to sing as you dance. And I was like, I'm out of breath. I don't know. I can't do that. And they were like, well, this is what musical theater is. You have to do both. I was like, okay. So that was a huge experience. I'm like, can't we just lower my mic? Like, isn't that a thing? You just lower it. Let me dance. And then you can bring it back up when like my catch my breath again. And they're like, no, (laughs) it's not how it works. I'm like, welcome to the big time. (laughs) This playhouse is is a big deal. It's not. If you're not working on Broadway, you basically want to be a paper mill playhouse, which now I know, but at the time had not a clue that that is how prestigious this theater was booking a show number one was a huge win for me but then number two at this such at this level and this theater was i feel kind of rare and also like a blessing in disguise like that theater has now become truly a second home to me i've worked there six times i will work there anytime they ask me to or anytime i could book a job there i will gladly work for them i absolutely love that theater going back to your semi-professional soccer career traveling cheerleader, (laughs) having all that athleticism already. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about how strong your quads were, like all that stuff was the work you did before to show up at this moment. And even though you were new to the audition and new to this world, like you had the juice, you had the Mm -hmm. sauce to show up and and deliver at a professional level, which I think is so super important. I think we got to put ourselves out there. We got to, we got to do things that are, that are uncomfortable and like, or maybe a little outside of our our range at that moment. But you still had the foundation of a professional dancer, Definitely. you know, going to school. And I think that's huge because you, 
you know, one could look at your career and say, man, at 17, she booked a, right. a professional gig. And then you're in Matilda a couple of years mm -hmm. later. And then Bronx Tale and all these like successes that you've had. And you're very young still. Right. So the sky is the limit at this time of your career. But I think what I see in that is just this athleticism and discipline right. and work ethic that you had built from really age four all the way right. to when you went to LaGuardia. And it started that, with this. It translates right. into success. And it's one of those things where like, yes, like now when you look at my resume, you're, everyone's like, wow, you have such a built resume. But the things that it takes to get there are strenuous <laughs> and you have to be willing to sort of forego what you think you would be doing at that time in your life and what actually comes into play. So, I mean, I truly have worked from like the bottom to then make it to the top. Like there has been nothing easy or given to me at all throughout the entire, like my theater career. Like I started yeah. with high school musical. I did another show, Hairspray at Paper Mill. I then went on tour with Beauty and the Beast, which was a non-equity tour. Then I did another show of paper mill. Then I went on a cruise ship and worked on a cruise ship doing rock of ages. Then I went like there. So there's been so many stepping stones to get to Broadway, which I think mm -hmm. has made me truly appreciate getting there and being there and not taking it for granted and knowing that you don't know how long your show is going to be open. So to truly like step on stage every night and just be, and just accept what's there and take it in. And now with the pandemic, not working for, I mean, a year and a half, close to two years, like it's really kind of another smack in the face to be like, you have to just constantly, no matter what job you get, just be grateful that you are able to still do what you've trained and loved to do. So that I yeah. think is also a thing. Like I wasn't one of those people who out of high school or college was just offered a show or just given an opportunity like that. Like everything has, has been work to get there, which I wouldn't change. I mean, obviously, do I want a phone call to be like, Brittany, do you want to come join us on this? Like, absolutely. But it's a testament, I think, to the work that I've put in from such a young age to how it's mm -hmm. now played out in where I am right now. So it's definitely, it's not easy. And that you had to pay your dues. <laughs> oh, I 100% yeah, you have paid, paid your paid dues. dues. <laughs> yeah. I definitely have an appreciation and a love and a pride that I was able to work that hard and truly get these things because of my talent and because of what I have to offer rather than because of who I know. Does that make sense? Well, and it's different if you played Belle mm -hmm. in Beauty and the Beast, right? Yeah. There's kind of a, a name recognition or, right. or a, you can put that on your resume. And, but when you're a dancer, you're oftentimes ensemble right. and you might be understudying some other roles and things like that. So all the hard work is really seen by the directors and the choreographers mm -hmm. and the people behind the scenes are like, she's magic. Right. She's got that <laughs> thing that, that, you know, and so it's almost like an, more of an internal relationship that you have to build with with your mm -hmm. crew that's sort of the same thing with um, being dance captain it's a very sort of thankless okay. position but you mm -hmm. truly hold the show together besides your swings so the dance captain is the person who truly knows every single track in the show every single part in the show and it would be my job if a new cast member would come in or if we had to run understudy rehearsals or any form of rehearsal it would fall on the dance captain and the stage manager. And so it's one of those jobs that, yes, it's noted in a program, but it's one of those where a lot of people don't understand what goes into that. When I dance captain to Bronx yeah. Tale, I lived at the theater, but has now transitioned me to be able to set the first national tour as the assistant choreographer. And then with the second national tour, I was the restager choreographer. So I truly set that entire tour myself with the associate director, Steve Edlin. So Dance captaining is a beast. <laughs> I know that you had to audition yeah. for Robert De Niro and Chaz and the whole crew. Yes. Talk about that moment where you had to go on stage and audition. This is for the Bronx Tale. Mm -hmm. And what that was like, just seeing Robert De Niro specifically out in the audience and then <laughs> having to deliver. I was on tour with Matilda at the time, being their swing for the children and adults. So I had to fly home. And because they knew my dance background and the extensiveness of my dance background, I only had to fly in to sing, which for me is literally immediate armpit sweat. Like if anything, I'm like, please just let me dance. <laughs> so that I had to fly home to sing and they sent music out to me for harmony work because there's only three Italian girls in the show. So each vocal part, a girl had to be on the alto, the middle and soprano line. So I had to learn all mm -hmm. three parts and then 
they were saying be ready to harmonize because they had to make sure that the grouping of girls would work together. So when I got to New York from tour, it was at Theater Row, which I was like, oh, that's strange. I didn't know they had like a rehearsal space there. And when I got there, you were auditioning on a stage with basically all of the producers, all of the creative team in the audience. So that was a big shell shock to me. Number one, I have to sing, which is one of those things that I always get so nervous for beforehand. And then number two, you walk in and the theater is already filled. This is like a performance audition. (laughs) This isn't just a normal audition where you're going into a room and a few chairs are set up behind the table. So walking in, of course. So real quick, real quick. Just, I mean, think that sets the stage. Yes. How do you get yourself in the right space, especially not, you know, being a dancer first right. and have to just sing? How do you do that? It was, so for me, it's one of those where like, I just have to be thrown to the wolves and it's going to be what it's going to be. So I went in there being confident in all the work that I put in to get here. Having worked with the team doing the dance lab, I felt a little bit more comfortable that like they sort of knew who I was. They had an idea of me and I was like, okay, all you got to do is, Truly just go in there, sing what you learned, get it over with and like get in and get out. Like Try not to to mess up or do anything that's going to prolong your time being in this room just for the sake of having to look at all these people. Luckily, the lights were kind of dim as well. I tried to not Mm -hmm. focus on the particular people in the audience and just just give them the best shot you can give. Just do the best you can. So even if you don't book this, you can leave there being like, you know what? I literally did everything I possibly could. And I felt as confident I was going to feel in there. And if I didn't get it, then at at least I'm okay with the audition that I had. And so that's sort of how I go into every audition is just like, do the best you can for that day. It's different every day, but just go in and do the absolute best you can so that you can't beat yourself up when you leave there, that it was your fault. You know what I mean? Because in the end, focus on what you can control. Right. If I could, I'd be in every show I'm (laughs) running. but I can't choose myself. <laughs> so it, it, that has sure. that mentality and that like way I, I kind of talk to myself being like, just go do it, go do it. You got this. You've rehearsed it enough. You're confident in what you've done. And if you don't get it, then okay, there's gotta be something else done down the line that's going to work out for you. So I flew back to tour and I ended up finding out a day or two later that I ended up booking it. And then I had oh to leave gosh. tour and yeah. the whole thing. But it was definitely a doozy. And I never have had to audition on a stage before then. And I've never had audition on a stage past then. So it was nuts. If I'm trying out for a basketball team, it's really about scoring points. Doesn't matter how exactly. I shoot the layup or shoot. Doesn't my, matter. If my Same form could be slightly just off, the, right? Just get the goals in the net. <laughs> get the goal. You know, steal the ball, go score a goal, right? But the other level with performance art is that you have to have not just technical skills, With singing, it's like you can sing all the right notes and it can sound like boo boo. Exactly. (laughs) Right. Because the tone or the or or the inflection. There's so many things. Or you're just so mechanical. That go into play. Right. And so there's that it factor Mm -hmm. that I think is one of those things that is the hardest thing to explain. Yes. You might say you either got it or you Mm -hmm. don't, but I don't think that's true. I think you can find it within yourself. Right. But It's, it's, it's about being honest with yourself, too. I grew up being very honest with myself and having very honest coaches and my parents are very honest and my teachers have been very honest where there's nothing sugarcoated. Like if you do it wrong, you do it wrong and you try again and get it right. There is a right and wrong in in most aspects. If you had a bad game, you then at practice all the things you messed up on, on that game prior, you now have to train and do better on to, to hopefully do better in your next game. And that's the same thing with dance and theater. And if, if you see yourself falling short in certain aspects, those are the things that you have to train double as hard in. And I think I have just been super honest with myself where I know I'm not the absolute best on Broadway. I know I'm not the absolute best in whatever I'm out to do, but I definitely am good enough to be within that grouping of being in the elite. Yeah. And I think sports, there's something really like truthful about sports mm-hmm. too. And when you play in it earlier, it's like you either score right, the goal you or you didn't you either win the game or you didn't. <laughs> exactly. There, like, There's no hiding that. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do in between. Right. Like if you didn't win the game, you didn't win the right. game. And I think that helps you have a sense of like where I am Definitely. as an athlete. Definitely. And then you trans take that into dance and, right. and you were in confidence from playing sports and, and just dancing right. and that kind of stuff. And then, right. So, you have the competitiveness of like, you get the role, mm-hmm. do everything you can, become the best you can be. But then you're out on stage and the curtains come up and whether you're a part of ensemble mm-hmm. or playing a specific role, how do you get to that yeah. place where you can be on point? You're not missing your marks. 
you're fluid. Everything's magic in that moment. Like, how do you do that? Or what, that, what does that feel like for you? So each day going into a show is not the same. How you wake up is not the same. What events happen before you get to the theater is not the same. So truly, although we're doing the same choreography and scene work eight times a week, your show is never the same at all. Sometimes your body is hurting. Sometimes you're feeling super flexible. Sometimes your voice is like insane today. And other days you're like, I barely had anything there. So in that regards, you're constantly, at least I try to always be in the moment because it allows you then to fully experience that show for what it is and not predict what's going to happen tomorrow or go back on what happened yesterday and harp on it. Like right now is right now. That's why it's live theater. Things go wrong all the time. Things go great all the time. So going in with that in my brain, I know like the show I did yesterday is not going to be the same show I did today. Although I try to keep the same caliber of the show and I try to output the same amount of energy and the same amount of focus on the show that I would have done any other day. But in reality, it's not the same show. With COVID and everything, that whole industry has just been put on pause. Mm -hmm. And it was like, now it's like, (laughs) did allow me to be able to go back home and teach again, which when you're in a show, it's really difficult Mm. to do. So as much as yes, the pandemic is horrible. Everything that's surrounding it is a headache in itself. But to try and get me through not working and not being in a show was truly Mm. now being able to like look back and be like, Okay, well, now I never have gotten to really go home and teach. My best friend has a studio on Staten Island, and I was able to teach her girls every Tuesday for two hours. And it was really humbling to come back to a job that I teach master classes on the road all the time, but I'm teaching other people's choreography. It's pretty strict on like you go in, you do a warm up, you teach the choreo from the show you're in, you do a QA, and a and you're out. And then those kids will come to the show and see it. And it's like a really great experience. But like, this is like, I was doing like technique training with them that I wish I had at their age and just kept trying to emphasize, like, if this is something you want to maybe do professionally, like try and start taking it seriously now at the age of 10. I didn't take it really seriously until I was in high school. So you guys have a few years on me. (laughs) Or like, if you want to do theater, like start taking singing classes early and not like me and do it in my senior year of high school. So it's like being able to like impart that and instill that in these kids at a younger age and just sort of help them navigate of course, a pandemic that they've never experienced either. And just be sort of that person that's, that's made it and can come home and be like, you can still do what you want to do. Like, this isn't going to stop you from achieving the goals and the dreams that you want to have. I was in Vegas and my wife and I saw O, Mm -hmm. Cirque du Soleil O. Everyone had masks on, including the performers that were on the very front of the stage. But it was packed and it was just because people absolutely need trans- interaction. Like, I was transcendent. <laughs> people need an escape. It, and, I, and that's what theater yeah. is, really. It's an escape. All of these live shows, it's people being able to escape from their reality. And everyone needs right. that. <laughs> and it's different from going to the movies. I think we're, we're uh, 100%. You know, it's so easy we're, to turn I, yeah. on Netflix or the movies. Yeah. And that's where obviously we believe in theater and, and how, how impactful it is. And I'm excited to see it come back. I'm excited Me too. to you know, see this. <laughs> I'm hoping these composers and, and, and writers out there are writing some great stuff right. in the next five years. are going to have all this incredible, right. like just influx of great <laughs> music and theater. And I mean, definitely. So there's that hope, right? Mm-hmm. That's my hope. So you're in a, a Bronx Tale mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you guys are getting close to going on Broadway and something happens at the train station. Like talk about that experience and how you dealt with that. So I live in Staten Island which in order to get from Staten Island to the city or the city to Staten Island, you have to take the train to the ferry, ferry across the water, then you're in Staten Island. So after rehearsal, we ended slightly early that day, threw on my backpack, was heading down to the train station at 42nd Street. And for the ferry at the time, you had to be in the first five car in order to the doors to open when they got to South Ferry. So where I enter the train station, it's towards the back of the train. So I had to walk towards towards the front. Literally, I've been traveling to Manhattan by myself since I'm 13 for high school. This has never happened to me. Knock on wood, it will never happen again. But as I was walking, there's a staircase and then like a little pathway. And then the yellow, like cautionary, try not to walk here if you don't have to tape um, on the floor. And I had, I was going to go towards the front of the car and there was a gentleman standing with in between where the stairs are and that yellow cautionary spot was and I knew I had a step in front and I just said sir excuse me I'm just going to step in front I have to get down towards the front of the train 
And as I stepped in front of him, I heard the train coming. So I knew I had to like get around quick, heard the train coming and he ended up pushing me into the incoming train. So if the train were to be stopped, I hit the second car. So it was still coming in full force because I was standing where basically the 10th car would have been on the train platform. So I ricocheted off, thank God, the second car of the train and flew down the platform as the train was still coming in and skidded along the like yellow caution, like don't step here. Don't know why he did it. Don't know. Still don't know. Like there's zero closure with this entire incident, but it was one of those things where thank God I had a backpack on because that took majority of the brunt of the train. But I had tons of internal things with like vertebrae and discs and my spine and my neck and all things from the whiplash of it all. But to be honest, because I think of my training in dance and like being an athlete and in soccer, sometimes getting slide tackled or whatever, like my instinct was just to tuck and go with it. I just hit and kept going. And so because of that, nothing was broken, I guess. So like, that's the positive in this whole thing. But New York people sprung into action and three gentlemen, luckily one came to me and one was screaming at the guy who pushed me and one was trying to stop the train conductor. And I was one of the girls that now delayed the subway at rush hour, which whenever you're a passenger on the train, you're like, oh, what happened now? Like that was me that day because of this push. And it was one of those things where you wish it on absolutely no one, but is so common. And until I was pushed, I didn't know how common it was. And the guy worked for the New York City Housing Department. He was well-educated, nothing wrong, older gentleman, but just had a bad day and admitted to pushing me. Didn't really get any repercussions. He got a few months of anger management. And for on his record for like six months, he had like a misdemeanor. We never got to go to trial and we never got to go to the grand jury because he was able to post bail and he was able to financially afford not having to go through that entire process. So because my injuries were internal and not external, no lawyer wanted to pick it up if I wanted to sue because what do they have to go off of? Like there's nothing physically on the outside. It doesn't look like anything happened to me, but let alone the mental, emotional, internal like injuries I was dealing with. Like I was in PT like four times a week and having to still do the show. Two days later, you you have a a presentation or we had a, it was like a big press event in the studio before moving into the theater to sort of give a sneak peek at what we've been doing with a Bronx tale. And they were doing the opening number, which I was a dance feature in and they did um, like two other numbers. So this whole thing happens after rehearsal. I'm calling people to come meet me in the train station. I'm now in the police precinct underground in the subway system and having to go to the hospital in an ambulance, like all these things that never have happened to me before. Like I've never had to sit in a precinct. I've never had to like give a statement. I've never had to do any of this. And luckily one guy in the show lived on 43rd street at the time. So I just met him. I'm not kidding. Maybe like a few weeks ago. And I was like, hi, this is Brittany. I have your number from the contact sheet. I just got pushed into a train. Like, is there anyone you could come and stay with me until my dad can come and sit with me? Truly. That's why Bronx Tale is a big Italian family because truly no matter what, any person would have dropped whatever they were doing to come and meet me, even if they just met me a week ago. And so even going back into rehearsal, I ended up going to rehearsal the next day, which everyone thought I was insane for. But I kept being pulled to have to talk to the DA. You have to tell this story. So like retelling the story over and over and over again emotionally was very traumatizing in the sense that, yes, you got pushed, but you're still in shock. Like I literally stood up after being pushed and I was like, oh my God, like I'm on Broadway next week. Like, are you kidding me? Like, is anything broken? And then like everyone's asking you all these questions as you're standing. And I'm like, I'm okay. I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay. Like, how am I going to call my parents and be like, I just got hit by a train. Like, it's just, it was crazy. I think the part of that whole thing was that there's no closure. There's no repercussion. There's nothing that makes it okay in any capacity. I'm not going to get an answer on why he didn't. Oh, you would think that, which is what I thought, because he knew he pushed me. He literally said, <laughs> yeah, I pushed you. I mean, it's undeniable oh, you would whether think, or not yeah, that happened. New York State it that. It is a temporary. Exactly. Right. Not in their eyes. It's, she's okay. <clears throat> Shouldn't we go with that? Well, well Whatever. So that has been the biggest sort of with that whole situation, the biggest challenge in being like, not everything gets the justice it deserves. And being okay with taking the higher road of being like, 
I'm still living. Thank God I didn't get pushed in the front of it. And so this man got off pretty much scot-free in my eyes, never got an apology, never came face to face with him to just be like, and I don't even know if I'd want it, but just to be like, do you realize what you just did to another human being? Like, do you realize the effects that now, like every time I go into a subway, I am paranoid that someone is going to push me? Like, does none of that crosses anyone's mind, obviously, when they're doing something completely outrageous like that. But like, you get to go back to living your life completely normal. And yet now every day when I have to go to work and go into the subway system, like I'm constantly standing in smack metal of these um, walkways. I'm never standing anywhere close to the edge. If I miss a train, I'm like, whatever, I miss the train. Like I will be late before I ever try and do what I used to do every day is just get to the front of the car, just get to the front of the train. Like that it's like it shifted your perspective to be like it's not worth it <laughs> i will take the pay cut and be late don't care i don't want to be hit by train again so um opening night and opening preview and doing the press event gave a whole new meaning besides just being my broadway debut it was now like no i'm alive i'm okay this is a debut and it's amazing but like i'm my body took care of itself to be able to keep me at this point and to let me do what I have worked so hard to do. Doing the press the second day after I got hit, no one wanted me to do it. They were like, Brittany, the swing will go on. It's not a big deal. Like, it's fine. And I was like, no, I am doing this damn number because I worked so hard to get to this spot. Like, I want to do it. Like, this is my chance and I can deal with my back and neck later. <laughs> Just let me do this six minute opening right. number and then we'll, we'll figure it out from there. I'll go to PT right after. Well, and I don't know if you felt this, but I, I just feel like right now I'm like, when screw that guy, right, he's going right. to stop like, me from exactly. doing my dream. And that's right? sort of the mentality it took is like, <laughs> F that. Like I worked so hard to get here. All right. I got pushed into a train. Right. Yes. I'm in a lot of pain and he should be totally brought up on a lot of other charges that he wasn't brought up on, but I'm not going to allow him to now not let me live out what I have been working so hard for. Like, exactly. It was one of those, like, forget that I'm doing it. So opening for like, not only me, but my whole family became much, much greater of, of an event than originally. I had close mm-hmm. to 70 people in the audience for the first preview of a Bronx tale. Like the Kanagati family took over the Long Acre Theater multiple times. <laughs> it was really, really That's special awesome. being able to do all that. And it just shows that like lots of things can knock you down physically and mentally. And you just have to find a way to persevere and not let anyone else interfere with what you want to attain. It's one thing to be told, we don't want you for this role. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to have something very traumatic happen to you physically. And and, it was then like having to to rehash it process. Like as I'm in rehearsals, like I'm then having to go into the train station to like reenact what I think happened to me and what actually happened to me. It's letting go of things. And I'm sure there's some listeners right now who want to like scream for some <laughs> listeners right now that are like, oh, you made her tell the story again. No, no, it's good. But and now I it's thank at you, a point thank where, you for talking about I that. Cause yeah, in the beginning, I probably yeah. would have still been crying, but now it's a part of my life and it, I should be able to talk about it. And I should be able to let other people know that there are some crazy peeps out there. Yeah. So be careful, but also don't let them stop you from doing what you want to do. I'm a big guy. So I don't, mm-hmm. I don't really, I would hitchhike Morocco. Wow. By myself when I was 24. I had no concept of somebody doing anything. Like, well, and to be honest, to neither did I. Like, I have such this, yeah, this like, blindsidedness and this naiveness about me where, like, I feel like most people at their core are good people. And I always want to believe that unless you give me a reason not to. And that man has zero good in him. <laughs> and he, mm. I, I don't know where he is right now. I'm hoping karma gets him real good. And that's all I kept saying is, like, his time will come. Like something will happen and yeah. it'll all in the end work out. But of course you go into a musical with all Italian people and they're like, what's his name? What's his name? Like, that's like the big question as if everyone's right, right. going to do anything, <laughs> but it's like, everyone's like, what's yeah. his name? And I was like, William yeah. or the entire company the next day, like surrounded me, hugged me, was like, what do you need? Like theater is a family. And like everyone just came yeah. to like totally surround from Chaz to Bob to Sergio to Mark, like, everyone swooped in to like yeah. be there, which meant a lot. Cause these people I only have known for a month at the time. So every show you get into becomes these new little families. It's yeah. really incredible being a part of that whole community. 
it's a testament to that whole culture of theater. Yeah, 100%. I want to hear about two of your big mentors in your life, besides your parents, like people that had a really big impact early on or throughout your career that's helped shape who you are. Professionally, Sergio Trujillo is definitely one of those men who just, he gave me a shot. <laughs> he took a chance on me, never having worked with me before. And then gave me the role of being in his ensemble as well as his dance captain, which is pretty much unheard of. If you're the dance captain, you most likely have worked with that choreographer before and you've already set up a rapport. So the fact that he saw something in me without knowing me truly has now helped my career down the line in allowing me to branch off into setting his shows and being a part of his shows. And then the other one would probably be Mark Kobe at Paper Mill Playhouse. He is the artistic director of Paper Mill Playhouse at the age of 17, gave me my first gig. I call him my theater dad because he has totally taken care of me from the age of 17 up until now. He also gave me my first swing job, which was at a show at Paper Mill with Hairspray. I swung for them. And that was my first big like thing other than being in the ensemble. I was like, what is swinging? Like, I have to learn all these tracks and how am I going to do it? Tell us, tell us what swinging is. I I don't think Uh, my audience would know exactly what swinging swinging is. Yeah. There's a lot of terms for swinging, swing dancing and others. So let's clarify so that real swinging quick. Swinging on Broadway or within theater is I have to know all of the tracks for the ensemble, specifically women most of the time. With Matilda, it was different. I did kids and adults, male and female. So with Matilda, I swung 22 people. So I had to physically be able to dance 22 different parts. They're full show. Hairspray, it was four. And I was freaking out as my first one. (laughs) Um, And that was four girls. Dance captaining, it's very similar to being a swing. However, you don't physically have to do all of the choreography for the 30 people you dance captain. You need to know to be able to teach them, but you never have to perform it per se. Unless you're a swing and dance captain at the same time, then it's different. So with swinging, they are the saviors of the show. If someone were to go out mid-show, if two people are out, they're doing a split track, which is combining two tracks into one and taking like the important parts of each track and making that into one track. Unbelievable. So your brain is literally working 24-7 and you're always at the theater and you never know when you're going to go on. Sometimes you get a swing on, which is very rare, but most of the time you're finding out day of the show, an hour before the show, during the show. So you're always on your toes. So Mark gave me my first swing position and I called him after I booked Hairspray. And I was like, what are you doing? Why did you give me the swing? Like, why aren't I in the ensemble? And he goes, Brittany, you will thank me later on. And I was like, no, I'm not, Mark. You know, I was a 19 year old, like, no, you don't know what you're doing. Like, I'm not going to thank you for this. I was like, whatever. I'm very excited to be a part of the show. So like, but then I'm like happy I'm in a show. And I'm like, I'm very happy to be a part of the show. But I really would rather not swing and be in the ensemble. He was like, you're going to swing the show. So. Fast forward, Mark propelled my career into this dance captain swing realm. I then swung Matilda. I then have dance captained ever since then. So I dance captained most of my shows at Paper Mill. I dance captained A Bronx Tale. I then became the associate. And then I became the restage choreographer, which is pretty much like executive dance captainess for The Bronx Tale. And then with prom, when I joined the prom, Mean Girls, I was their vacation swing. So I like run in for them if like anyone goes on vacation or has an extended leave and like learn that track and go on for it. And then with prom, when I went in my first show for prom, I was replacing an ensemble member, but I ended up doing a split track, my first show for them. I wasn't even supposed to be done with rehearsals. I picked up pretty quick. So I was ready, I guess. And they threw me on in a split track and they're like, we know you're not our swing and you're just filling in for the ensemble. But like with your brain and like what you've done, like we feel like you can do it. And I was like, Just tell me where to be and what to say and what to do. I got it. Like, don't worry about it. It's definitely crafted my career in a sense of like, anytime you see swing or dance captain on a resume, you know that person has a different sort of brain. And so that has now allowed me to do shows and things that maybe I wouldn't have done had Mark not given me that that opportunity to be the swing at Hairspray at Paper Mill. So. It's a shift from like being singularly focused on oh, a role. Oh, absolutely. Or a because dance even if you're in your own track, like you have to, to be like, aware of people around you. And like if another person mm-hmm. is on with you, but like for the most part, you're responsible for that one part. Like as a swing, like yeah. you're responsible for everyone's part at every moment, at the drop of a hat. And especially on Matilda with the kids, they would come off stage and bang their hand and be like, I'm out. I can't do it. My pinky hurts. And then they're like, Brittany, get dressed. And I'd be on in the next scene. So like, 
you truly never know when you're going on for a swing. And so that's, that's another like thankless role for sure. That doesn't, I think get the proper recognition that I think it deserves because it is something that really (laughs) requires a specific mindset. Right. And sort of, and physically, because you're not in the show technically every day. So like you're not warming up before the show every day in rehearsals, you're mostly sitting on the side taking notes. Or if you're up doing stuff, you're like in the back marking it. Like you're never getting the chance to fully do things full out until you're thrown on. Now they have tried to put into effect within our union that you can only swing up to 10 people. And if you swing more than 10, you then get like pay increases to sort of incentivize whether producers want to do that or hire another swing or they pay the swing to do multiple or over 10 people. Yeah. And going back to the point that you have a probably immense notoriety and respect in the crew because they understand the hard work, whereas the audience has no idea. They're like the crew of the shows. They get it. Are amazing. Yes. Right. Even the backstage yeah. guys, like everyone at the Long Anchor, luckily, like I did Bronx till at the Long Anchor and prom. So when I was coming back for prom, the crew knew before I knew they were messaging me and texting mm-hmm. me being like, we hear you're coming. And I was like, am I like, I don't know yet. And they were like, uh, never mind, maybe not. And then they got like, they knew, but so they become a huge family yeah. too. Like all the crew guys, like the lighting engineer and the prop guy and the stage right guy that pulls the curtain and the stage like there's literally like nicknames for everyone like the guy on a bronx tale who works stage left literally we called him willie curtains because his job for the show was to pull the curtain when we had to enter and close it <laughs> so there's like if those people become a family too you see the same people every day and so it truly is yeah. a huge family so when i got to go back for prom everyone was so sad when we left for bronx tale And then when they heard that I was coming back for prom, it was basically like a big welcome home party at the theater. There's whispers and even some dates of like Broadway's coming back Mm -hmm. and and this and that. And I know everything's a little bit in flux now with the Delta variant and all that kind of thing. Do you already have any gig coming up that you're getting to be a part of or or soon soon to be a part of? I do, luckily. I actually just booked it on Friday. So I can't say anything just yet. So this is breaking news. Mm Mm-hmm. So I can't say, say what it but is yet we know something's because going on. I'm very, right. I'm crazy in the sense that unless I sign my name on the dotted line, I don't tell anyone sure. about it except for like my very close, like family and friends who I know aren't going to say anything. And also a lot of shows, you're not allowed to actually say anything until the first day of rehearsals or until they do their press release. So there's like some logistics behind okay. it, which I totally get. But luckily I will be home for the holiday, which I'm very excited about. So I'll be doing this. Well, here's what I'm going to do. Whenever the information comes out, I'm going to put it in the show notes because this podcast is going to come out in September. Oh, perfect. But even if we find out later, I'm going to put the information. So if you're listening to this and you're like, man, I want to know what she's in, look to the show notes. Yes. And her website's going to be on there too. Yes. So that people can find out more information about you. There's going to be ways for you to see. And I'm going to put some uh, YouTube videos, uh, just of a couple other interviews and things like that, because I want people to not just fall in love with Broadway dancing, Broadway in general, but you and you should be a celebrity (laughs) for for all that you're doing, even though, thank you, you know, people don't give the same respect to the dancer. I don't, you know, they will one day. day. So besides the the musicals you've been a part of already, Mm -hmm. what is a musical that's absolutely like you would just die to be a part of if you had the opportunity? Wicked. Um, what would that musical be? That, wicked. I have easy. That not was even close. Probably the first show I watched, and I looked to my friend. We went for mm-hmm. her 13th birthday, and I said, "I want to do that." Love it. Well, thank you so much. This has been an absolute just joy for me to hear your stories and kind of reconnect with the world of Broadway. I, thank and, you. Uh, tell us your website, and can people? Obviously, if they're in the New York area, mm-hmm. they could reach out to you for dance. Oh, of do course. You do any I also virtual, do, yeah, uh, I do virtual. I do all over the map. So, yep. Willing, great. able. So from yoga to dance to if you have questions or want to know more or want to break into the industry. It's BrittanyConagati.com, yeah, right? Very easy. BrittanyConagati.com. Yeah. Yep. It'll be in the show notes. Perfect. So you can check it out there and, and see more about her. As a performing artist, it's really interesting to hear a perspective, not just on performance and the athleticism it takes to really be at the highest level that she needs to be, but also just the mindset around auditioning, which I think was a huge takeaway, just the way she thinks about an audition. Like she's like, hey, I've done the work. I'm just gonna go be myself, be my authentic self and trust that that's enough. You can't always put it on them. Like, did I get the job that I not? It may not have anything to do with what you can control. You just have to go out there and do your best. 
And that's the same thing with sports too. You just gotta go out there and do your best. Sometimes you can't control the outcome, especially if it's a team sport. The team may not play as well as the other team and you may lose the game, but you can show up at your best and know that you're gonna stay true to who you are and what you know is the best version of yourself. All right, so like I mentioned in the show notes, you're gonna get a lot more information about Brittany, her website, her Instagram handle, all those things. And as soon as we have more information about the new show that she's a part of, I'll drop it in the show notes and I'll post it on Instagram so you can get that information as soon as possible. Here's my one ask. Think about somebody who needs to hear this episode or one of the recent episodes from the Mindset Forge podcast and share it with them. Challenge them to listen because there's so much. I know that some people have a hard time getting through 45 minutes to an hour episodes. Maybe they don't have a long commute or something like that, but sometimes it just takes you telling them, hey, give this a listen. I think you're gonna get a lot out of it. Thank you so much for listening. Love having you as a part of this community and just can't wait to bring on more and more great athletes and performing artists to come. So have a wonderful day and thanks for listening to the Mindset Forge podcast.